guess we'll play. There we go. Hi, welcome to my talk on WebStorm. Um, I'm Nick Nisi, and to today I'm going to talk to you about a great uh, IDE called WebStorm. It's, oh, never mind, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm a web developer, I don't need that crap. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> welcome to my talk on Vim. Uh, I'm Nick Nisi. And uh, I'm here to talk to you about Vim and why it's awesome. Um, does anyone here use Vim, like, full-time? I do. Okay, you guys are probably better qualified than me. Everyone's always better qualified than me to talk about this. Um, but, yeah, I, I got into Vim uh, probably three years ago, and I've been using it full-time ever since. And um, I really like it. I've switched from kind of Sublime and IntelliJ. Or, yeah, IntelliJ. Um, into Vim and haven't looked back. Uh, so I'm here to tell you that you don't need a full IDE and that you can make your own uh, out of something as awesome as Vim. And it's also terrible because once you learn Vim, then you'll want to use Vim key bindings everywhere and that'll get you in trouble. Um, but why Vim? It's a highly customizable IDE or uh, editor. It runs everywhere. I have a Vim app on my phone so that I can use Vim on my phone. And can't, I don't even have a file system on my phone, but I have Vim. Um, <laughs> it works with many programming languages, and you can add in more with um, with plugins. And it's highly scriptable. So let's install Vim. It's probably already on your machine if you just go type Vim, unless you're a Windows user. Um, but we're not. We're Mac users, right? So we can <laughs> install it, or we can just use it. Um, if we install it, uh, the best way I, I think to install it is from um, Homebrew, which is a package manager for OS X, if you're on OS X, that is. Um, and you just do brew install macvim dash dash override system vim, and that will override the, um, the terminal vim so it, that it, it just shows up first and we'll use that vim instead. That way, uh, I think OS X, I think 1010 uh, ships with 7.3, but macvim will give you vim 7.4 so you get uh, all of the latest goodness and some Mac specific stuff as well. Uh, but there's also brew install Vim if you just want to get Vim without uh, Mac Vim. I don't actually use the GUI Mac Vim. I just use it in the terminal as I'll show. So some of the features of Vim. Um, modal editing. That's probably the thing that everybody knows about uh, from Vim. It's um, kind of what gives it its distinction. You can't just open a file and expect to edit it because you're not in insert mode when you first start out. You're in normal mode and you have to switch into a specific mode to actually be able to edit it. The modal, modal editing just basically gives you a number of different keyboards so that you have different keys that do different things when they're in different modes. So you start off in normal mode that's where you navigate the structure of the file, insert or uh, delete lines, change lines, uh, and do creative things to get into insert mode. Uh, insert mode is where you actually edit the file. Visual mode is like highlighting portions of the file uh, so that you can delete them, change them, uh, edit them, manipulate them in different ways. And then EX mode. Uh, does anyone use EX mode? Only by accident. Yeah, EX mode is the <laughs> one that I usually get into by accident and have to figure out how to get out of. <laughs> Just type in visual and hit enter. That's all I know. Yeah, all I know exactly. <laughs> I actually have it disabled in my uh, VimRC so that I can't get into it. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't use it. Uh, I wish I were cool enough to use it, though. Maybe someday. <clears throat> so normal mode uh, is probably the, the coolest one to talk about. And that's where we'll start. The first thing is, everyone always tells you when you get into Vim, don't use your arrow keys. Don't use a mouse. You're programmers. You want to strive to be lazy. That's something that a teacher in college always burned into my head was strive to be lazy, strive to do things as minimal as possible. And I am so lazy that I don't want to move my hand like four inches down to the mouse or two inches down to the arrow keys. If I can just stay on the home row, I'm happy. So I use HJKL, uh, left, up, down, right. Um, when I first started out, I actually had this in my VimRC where it disabled the arrow keys so that they would instead echo out, stop being stupid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so that kind of forced me. It was really frustrating in the beginning. Uh, now I have them back in, but I never use them. So it's kind of, now I try and use HJKL everywhere else. So I'll always be instant messaging with somebody and I'll hit JKJK, JK, kind of just playing around and then <laughs> I send that to them and 
by now everyone at work knows. You, but. Do, do you also end messages with colon W? Yes, <laughs> sometimes. Sidebar, do you know why HDKL? Um, I was assuming because it's on the home row. No, it's because the original keyboard that Vim was developed on, or VI was developed on, uh, used HDKL as the arrow keys. Oh, okay. Huh. Yeah, so that makes it sense. It was like there was a meta key, and you'd use them as arrows. Gotcha. So. Nice. So they just got rid of the meta keys. Yeah. <laughs> There's also like now if you if you follow the Vim, I don't know, blogosphere or whatever, everyone's disabling J and K now. Like that's too inefficient. Hitting J a bunch of times to go up and down. You got to find better ways to do that. And I've kind of just naturally stopped using J and K so much. I will for you know moving up or down a couple of lines, but the one I use the most is probably Control E and Control Y. Uh, I have that, uh, that that's set up by default to scroll down, scroll the the file down um, a little bit at a time, um, and scroll the file back up a little bit at a time. I actually have it set in my VimRC to do it three times faster than it normally does. Oh, so it's like scroll lock. Yeah. That nobody ever. It used. keeps your cursor where it's at, but it scrolls things up until mm -hmm. it gets to the top, and then it scrolls, keeps the cursor at the top, and keeps scrolling. Uh, control F and Control B will scroll down a full page, or up a full page. So whatever you're seeing on Vim, it will take that and move it all the way up and then show you everything else that can fit on the page. Um, H, M, and L, that will move the cursor to different um, places in the window itself. So it'll move it to the top of the window, the middle of the window, or the lower part of the window. And then there's things like GG. Um, there's actually capital G on there, but it got cut off on this slide. Uh, GG, if I hit GG, it will put me at the top of the file, or capital G will put me at the bottom of the file. So here's Vim, if you haven't seen it before. Um, if I hit GG, I went up to line one. Capital G, I went to line 31. Um, H to the top of the file, I actually have it not all the way to the top. M and L. Um, and then Control E will actually scroll the window. So this is like if I want to see something that's at the bottom of the file, I can scroll it up so it's not at the bottom of the window. So I can see it better. And Control Y will go the other way. And then Control F will go a page at a time. And so I've kind of just burned that into my memory of what I do. And I, I actually had to like go practice in a file to be able to write down what all of those were because I just don't even think about it. Oh, <laughs> hang on, I here, there. I downloaded this program to actually show what I'm typing, so. What is the program? Keycaster, it's open source, um, right. but it's a really real pain because it you have to manually uh, add it to the assistive devices list. Okay. But that's okay. Gotcha. Well, these days I think you have to do that to anything. That yeah. Controls stuff. So that makes you super elite programmer person. Looks really awesome. You're hacking the Gibson <laughs> when you're doing that. Um, but that's not what really makes Vim cool to me. I think that Vim has the secret sauce that breaks down into three things, three or four things, I guess, however you look at that list. Um, I think that the nice, nicest pieces of Vim are text objects and motions, the dot command, and macros. So text objects and motions, um, when, when you think about that, you think about the file as more than just a file with characters in it or words in it, well, words in it, I guess, but more than just characters that you're manipulating in an editor like you do in other editors. Um, so text objects would be like words and sentences and paragraphs and tags. Uh, tags are only in XML and HTML files. And these are something that you can program in too. You can add these in. Plugins add in their own tags. Uh, for example, um, tags, I'm trying to think of a specific one, but maybe like a, a JavaScript plugin will actually uh, have like a function uh, text object where you can manipulate a full function at a time and delete the contents of the entire function or other things. You can easily add them in um, on your own or Plugins will do that as well. But the ones that are kind of built in and the ones that I use the most are words, uh, not so much sentences or paragraphs, uh, but tags definitely when I'm editing HTML. And then there's motions. Um, so actually, going back to this, oops, going back to share. Um, so if I'm in a file, like I'm hitting H to go back to the beginning of the line. Um, if I'm you know, in here I can say W, and that will move me ahead one word at a time to the beginning of the word. There's also E to go to the end of the next word. Um, and 
so that's a way of moving and there's uh, other ones as well but that those are kind of the main ones I use so when I'm scrolling a file um, vertically I'll usually use control E or control Y and then when I'm uh, actually scrolling horizontally I'll typically use W and hold that uh, to move as I need to uh, horizontally <coughs> Whoops. so then there's motions that you can do as well so you can say like A for all I can say I want to select all of this word or I want to select in these quotes or I want to select until something uh, and then you can also use F and capital F to find forward and backward so I can say I want to do something until the next time I find an S or uh, going right or uh, going left if you use capital F so we can mix those together uh, combine them with commands and uh, then we can do things to them so these are the commands that you can do you can do things like delete uh, this is like cutting because it'll put it on the default um, the default register uh, or not register but clipboard um, there's change which is the same thing as delete but it after you get done changing something it puts you into insert mode so that you can immediately change it and then there's yank um, to copy and then V to visually select that will put you into a visual mode so we can combine those together uh, to make different motions that we want to do and we can edit our file a lot faster so we can have a command optionally we can have a number before the command so that we we can say that we want to do this for the next four like repeat the command four times um, then a command and then the text object or motion that we want to do so we can do things like DIW delete in word so if I go here I'm in grid node right now. I have grid node highlighted. If I do DIW, I deleted grid node because it deleted inside of that whole word. There's CAW. Uh, so this will change all of the words. So if I do CAW, it did the same thing, but it would also grab the white space on either side of that if there were white space on that. But now you can see, I don't know if you can tell in the bottom left corner, it put me into insert mode uh, right there. And um, so now I can immediately start changing it. Jay, did you have a question? So I use CW all the time? Yeah. Is that doing the same thing as CAW? What does AA do? So you use CW. If I used CW right here, I'm on the I of grid node, yeah. it will change from where I'm at to the end of the word. Oh, C -A -W. But CAW will change the whole word. It doesn't matter where I'm at in the word. <laughs> <laughs> I know all of the those... H's that you could have saved, right? We're striving to be lazy, Jay. <laughs> so let's change all word. And we can do other things like motions. We can say we want to yank all of the text inside of the parentheses. So going back um, here, I'm inside of the parentheses. I'm just somewhere inside of here. I can say I'm actually going to change it to delete because that's a lot more... Um, visually noticeable what I'm doing in here but I could say I'll delete inside of the square brackets and I just deleted everything in there that was uh, DIW oops oh, I'm sorry yeah DI bracket there we go thank you but see now if I did that was DIW so it left the brackets there if I did DA bracket it deleted the brackets too And I can say, like, I want to delete until, or DT, delete until the space. And I deleted until the space. Or I can say DF to delete until the space, including the space. So, yeah, we're just striving to be lazy here. Uh, so, 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 CA paren? Yep. That would, that would delete the parentheses itself, uh, delete everything in the parentheses, including the parentheses, and then put you into insert mode so that you can then immediately start typing. How do I keep the parentheses? CI. CI, yeah. CIW. Yeah, so you think about it like inside for I, A is like all, delete all including that. T, like delete until, like that's how I, that's how I think about it. I'm stupid though. Um, VA, this would visually select all inside of the double quotes, including the double quotes. So if I'm inside of here, the, this is actually single quotes, but I'll VA that, and now I'm visually selecting all of that. And now I can do something with that. I can hit Y to yank that. Now it's on my keyboard, or on my clipboard, and I can paste that in. Uh, I just did 
Command B to paste it in, but I could also P to paste it in. Um, oops. Uh, is that a Mac film extra? Uh, no, I'll, I'll kind of talk about that. Kind of the, some of the things that I have set up to make working with Vim easier in a modern OS. <clears throat> um, so that's that's command uh, motions and text objects. Um, and that's really awesome. The second piece of the secret sauce is the dot command right there. Uh, <laughs> um, it lets you repeat whatever the last command was that you did. <laughs> it just repeats it. That's it. But it's really awesome. Um, so like if I am in here and I said, this is where using C um, really comes into play um, because that will put you, that'll delete and then put you in insert mode so that that's all, anything that you change that to and then hit escape, that's all a single motion. So if I had this string and I just wanted to say CI uh, single quote and then foo and then escape, that's a single motion. So now I can go down to this other string and hit the dot command, hit the dot command, oops, hit the dot command. It just always repeats that last motion that I did so that I can easily change it anytime. So that's where, like, I will uh, sometimes spend time, I'll do something, and then I'll be like, wait a minute, I could do this in a single command so that I can repeat it. And I'll actually undo and then redo it in a single command just to see if I can do it kind of as practice. And uh, it makes it a lot easier for, um, for working with that and making it, making it uh, really useful. <clears throat> so... There's additional commands that we can do. There's dd and yy. That's delete or yank the current line. So if I yy'd that, then I p for pasting. I pasted the same exact line. It doesn't matter where I'm at on that line. It always copies it. If I dd it, it cuts it, and then I can paste it somewhere else. What's p versus capital P? Uh, yes. So, oh, sorry. That should be on here, but it's not. It's got it got cut off on the slide. Um, P will paste it below. Capital P will paste it above the line that I'm currently on. So all of these commands, I mean, they start. If you start thinking about it, like you know, delete till dt, uh, you know, change in ci. Like, I just start singing that while I'm programming. Do you guys sing while you're programming? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have to do that to keep from crying sometimes. <laughs> um, there's the caret and the dollar sign that moves your cursor to the beginning or the end of the line. I Capital I and capital A does the same thing, but it puts you into insert mode. So that's another one that we can do to really uh, help us speed things up. So like, let's say that we had var foo equals true, bar equals baz, uh, bax equals bug. I don't know. These aren't real things, but I'll put quotes around them. I repeated that command. Did you see that? I did. Yeah, what was that? That's actually a, a an additional text object that I brought in with a plugin, which I'll kind of talk about. But I did uh, YSIW single quote. And it grabbed the word in word and put um, single quotes around it. And then there's another plugin that makes that special text object repeatable with the dot command. So then I can hit dot and now magic. Um, so I have all of these, right? These variables. And then all of a sudden your style guide changes and you can't do multiple declares with a single var. Now you have to do it at the beginning. Um, you have to do a var for each one of these. So what I could do is I could do capital A to go to the end of the line, delete, semicolon, escape, and then here, it doesn't matter where I'm at in this line, if I just hit the dot command, I'm gonna go to the end, delete one key, and insert a semicolon. Same thing here. And then I can go to the beginning of the line, capital I, delete, var space, escape. Same thing over here, I can delete any time. It will go to the beginning of the line. And when I say beginning of the line, you can see that I'm actually tabbed over. Um, it will go to the beginning of the, actual, the, of the first non-white space character and work from there. So, now we saved a whole lot of time doing that in two commands that were repeatable and then repeating it each time. I could also, um, with that, I could just highlight these and then I could say, whoops, 
Can I do that? Yeah, I could highlight those and then hit the dot command and do them all at once. So I can save some time like that. But that was still two commands. Because uh, I had to go to the end of the line and then the beginning of the line and it's just so much. I'm lazy. So let me, re let me reset that so that I can play with, ah, oh, too far. Vim's uh, history is also phenomenal. It will go back forever. And I can say, I can say earlier two minutes and it will go to the file two <laughs> minutes ago. So, yeah, exactly. There's a lot more to it. Oh, I'm, okay, there we go. Okay, so see my, I, I actually have a plugin in here called Syntastic that is hooked into my JS Hint and JS CS plugin. Um, that, that's Java, uh, JS Hint, which is a linter, and JS CS, which is JavaScript code style. We have these defined code styles at work. Everything has to be coded the same way. Uh, if I don't push up every, uh, code that matches the, the um, JS Hint and JSCS um, syntax, then it actually cancels my push and I have to go fix it. So it's just telling me that here on this line, foo is defined but never used. So I'm, using, I'm creating a variable that I'm never using. That's against our code style. Anyway, um, so those are the additional commands. Um, <clears throat> so like I said, I always think about things, try and make them repeatable as much as I can. Uh, and then I practice it. So I'll undo, I'll undo forever and then repeat. I'm, I'm saving so much time with Vim that I have the time to, to do this. Not really, but uh, <laughs> sometimes I'll do that because it, it does make it more fun. Um, and if I have to repeat it a lot, then it, it really does make a difference. But not everything is repeatable with the dot command. Um, as we saw in the previous example, the two, uh, I had to do two different commands and then repeat them uh, to change the beginning of the line and the end of the line. But we can do that all in a single command if we want with macros. So we can record ourselves doing something and then replay it over again and um, then do it again. So a macro is just a sequence of commands recorded that are recorded to a register and you can pick any register uh, and record it to them and then you can actually save those off to your vimrc and have them loaded up when you load vim so that when you access that register it's already loaded with that macro and then you can just immediately repeat it if it's something that you really have to do all the time. So to record a macro all you do is hit the Q, um, the Q button You've probably seen this where Vim will say in the bottom left corner, recording, and you're like, why is it recording? What, the NSA? Ah. Um, but that's just because you hit Q and then some other key, and you're recording into that other key. So then you hit Q, do all of the things, and then you hit Q again to stop recording, and then you access that register by using the at symbol and then whatever the register was. So at Q or at whatever uh, will access that. So let's record a macro to fix this. I'm actually going to, so I have, I have this line, which is different from these two other lines, right? But this line is, uh, I'll just fix that. And then this line, I'll record myself. I'm going to hit Q, W to save into the W register. So now it says recording in the bottom left-hand corner. Now I want to um, move to the front of the line. So I'm going to hit Command I, or uh, capital I, and then I'm going to delete one key, or delete one uh, character, which is the tab character, and then I'm going to spell out var, then hit escape, then I'm going to hit capital A to go to the end of the line, delete that, and replace it with a semicolon, and then escape, and then I'm going to hit Q again to stop recording, and so now I'm done recording, now I can hit at W, and it did the same thing, it just repeated the same thing over and over. So I could it will just do the same thing for all of these, but I can actually highlight. I used Shift V, so capital V, to highlight the full line, and then JJ to highlight the next two lines. And then I could just say colon uh, normal to tell it to run a normal mode command at W. And it will run that for, it'll run that macro for every line that I have highlighted. It didn't do anything because it, it well, it actually did. It replaced the, the tab with var on each of those. Um, so macros are really cool like that. You can repeat commands over and over and over and uh, use them. Some other cool things that you can do, um, like if I have a data field, 
But yeah, that's an array. Oop. So embarrassing. Um, <laughs> so I have an array of objects, let's say. And I, this is object zero. This is object. Um, uh, and then, you know, name, foo, whatever. Um, and I want to actually copy this several times. Um, what I can do and make and like make test data, right? I'll say I don't know description. Ugh, I'm so bad. I'll do that and I'll do foo zero. Ugh, there we go. Okay, so I have this here. Put a comma at the end. And then what I can do actually is I can say um, uh, I can record a macro that will gener auto generate all of this for me uh, without me having to really do anything. So one thing that I want, I obviously want to have different IDs for every item in my data. Uh, what I could do is I could start recording. Well, I'll start recording from, um, let's see, how would I do this? Oh yeah. So I'll, I'm actually going to create an ID field. Well, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to call it zero, right? And then I'm going to mark this line. And you can do that with the M key. You can say M, and then you can assign that to, uh, I don't know if they're called registers uh, or, or what, but I can assign that to a specific location. So I'm going to say MK. So anytime that I, when I'm, whenever I'm in my file anywhere, if I hit, um, the tilde K, it puts me right back to that spot in the file, always. So that can be useful. Another thing that's going to be useful, I'll show it in a second, but I'm going to start recording right now. Um, so I have that saved to MK, then I'm going to save this to MM. This is the current line that I'm on, MM. So now I'm going to, Actually, I, I will record myself doing that. So I'm going to hit QQ to save to the Q register. And then I'm going to hit MM to save that, uh, to mark this line. Then I'm going to um, go to the K register. So at, uh, tilde K. And I'm going to hit Control A. And I'm going to increment it to 1. Then I'm going to, um, I'm going to, YIW to yank in the word. Then I'm going to move back to my M register, which is right here. And I'm going to say that I have to go to um, that zero. So I want I don't want to just say move to zero because on the next line it's going to be one and my macro would be broken. So I can't do that. I have to move over to there. So I'm just going to say I want to um, F space to go to the next white space right there. And then I'll just move over and I will hit the R key to replace the single, um, oh wait, I'm going to do this totally bad, but I'll just do VIWP, and I'll replace that with one. Then I'm going to go two white spaces characters over, so I'm going to do two F space, oops, wait, oh yeah, so it should have been three F space, so I'll do F space again. Sorry, it's all being saved, so it'll just repeat everything that I'm doing. Just totally fine. Even if I mistakes and fix it. exactly, if I undo, it will do my mistake, undo it, and then redo it. Uh, but it'll happen so fast that I'll just look like I'm magic. So it's it's all good. So here I'll do it again. V I W P. Oh, but I pasted in zero because I copied that to my. So I'll just do I'll just do this totally bad. I'll mark this spot now. Go back to here, yank this, go back, and then I'll do, uh, okay, and then I will do, I'll get the spaces right this time, one, two, three, so 3F three space, over one character, mark it, go back to K, yank it, go back to M, paste it, and then I'm done, I think. Yeah, uh, I'm overwriting it each time I did the paste. When you overwrite with a paste, it, the thing that you overwrote goes back into the, the yank buffer. Actually, every key, though, is a is a, its own buffer, so I can actually save it to a different buffer. If I was better at this and not 
nervous about screwing it up, I would just save it to a different buffer and then cut, paste from that buffer every time. <laughs> so I didn't fully do this the correct way, but I'll just yank this line and paste it, and then I will run the macro command. Uh, so I save that to the Q register, so I'll run at Q. Ah, oh, totally screwed up. Okay. I'm it's because it started from the wrong place. I think I have to start from here. Um, nope. Pretend that that worked, and it'll be awesome. <laughs> can you bring up the macro and edit it? You can, but I don't remember how to do that off the top of my head. But you absolutely can. You absolutely can. Um, Does it get stored in a register? Yeah. You call reg and Is that? Yeah. Oh, I can't see because of that stupid thing. <laughs> It was on Q, so there it is. Yeah, so it's basically all the, everything you typed. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can you can copy it out and then modify it and then save it back to another register. Is that how you do it? I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> I just use that for copying and pasting. But like I said, I've only been using Vim for three years. You have to like. That would make so really awful so the the registers like I think the double quote is the. Maybe it's quote zero is the last thing you yanked. Yeah. And there's a stack of them that goes one through nine, so you can go back to the fifth thing that you yanked and grab that if you want. Okay. So you can do quote 5P and that'll paste the fifth thing. Okay. So let's try that. You said quote 5P. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's right. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Well, we'll pretend that worked. I'm going to move on. The macro? That would, yeah, you could. Okay. I like, suppose then yank it back like into the register. And then yank it back in. Yeah. Back in yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so pretend that you were amazed by that. <laughs> um, so those are the, th the three things that I think really make them awesome to work with. Because if you, if you get them down, and of course there's a lot that I haven't gotten down yet. And I'm sure there's a lot that you haven't gotten down yet too. Um, but you, you keep learning and you keep editing better and getting lazier and it's great um but then the other thing that's cool about vim is plugins but other ids have plugins as well um these are some of the plugins that i use that i think are really great for anyone who's going to use vim uh Vundle is a plugin manager so it will just manage all of your plugins all you have to do is put plugin space and then the GitHub URL minus the github.com part. Like so, if I wanted to put vun manage Vundle with Vundle, which you can do, you would just have plugin um, gmeric slash Vundle because gmeric is the user on GitHub that has it, and Vundle is the repository on GitHub that has it. It will automatically load that in when I run the plugin command, plugin install command, so that I can manage that, and I can manage all of the plugins that I want from there. And they don't have to be from GitHub; they can be from vim.org or wherever. Uh, but out of the box, it works really easily with GitHub. It's worth it. Yeah. That, that's the number one plug out of everything. Yep. The other one, maybe not. Maybe you don't need so much. Uh, I end up working. Uh, I do a lot of support, so I end up working with a lot of different files and a lot of different repositories. And having a file drawer makes it easier for me to work with that. I can see all of the all of the files that are there. I can easily work with them. Um, if I hit, I have it mapped to. Uh, leader K that opens my file drawer. This is nerd tree. So I can see all of the directories and files in here and I can, you know, hit enter, close these. Um, this is actually where using MacVim, I'm going to shut off those keys for a minute uh, so you can see it, but this is where using MacVim comes into play uh, on the Mac. If I hit M, I get this list of things that I can do. So I have grid.js highlighted. I can add a new child node here, move that so I can rename the file, delete the file. Uh, here, reveal and uh, quick look are the two that MacVim adds in so that I can I can reveal that. So I'll hit MR to reveal that in Finder. It'll open Finder and show me that file. Um, and then there's also M, oops, focus, MQ. Uh, We'll quick look that, so I'll get the quick look view of that file if I need to. I hardly ever use this, but I do use MR to reveal in Finder all the time, especially when I have to like 
work with images or something. It just makes it easier to navigate out of that. But this is uh, here. I can add a new file, ma foo.js. Now I have foo.js, and I can open it right over here. <clears throat> so making it makes working with that a lot easier. Control P is a fuzzy file finder. This is really necessary uh, to quickly navigate the file. So if I wanted to open uh, test class, I could just go down a couple, or I could do, I have it mapped to uh, leader T. It pops up and gives me a list of all of the files, and now I can just do uh, fuzzy find. So I can say test class.js. And I didn't have to type all of it out, but it found it, found everything that matches uh, from that and then I can immediately open it from there. It also keeps track of every file that you have open in your register, so I have that mapped to leader R, and these are all of the files I have, oops, all of the files I have open in registers, and I can uh, filter that list with, um, just by typing as well, so I can op open toolbar back up or whatever. <clears throat> Fugitive is a Git tool. This is fantastic. Um, it does things, let me move to a repository that has Git on it or uh, is maintained by Git, like this one, this is Dojo. Um, I can do things like colon g blame, and I can see uh, who edited every single file, or every single line in this file. And if I want to get more information, like maybe this is the bug I'm curious about, I can hit O, and it will show me the diff and the commit message from that commit for that line. And I can edit it, or I can view it right there. I can also uh, navigate history, from within here, I can um, um, get the log of this file, and it will load every file or every version of this file in uh, a buffer, so that then I can do um, I can do square bracket Q, I think, to go to the second version, the third version back, keep going back and back and back, and I can look at each version of the file, and then when I want to go back to the head that I'm on, uh, just G edit goes right back. Uh, there's plugins to do that. This one won't. If I change things, if I went in and deleted this, that code and saved it, then I can do uh, g diff. And because my editor is so big, it's putting it top to bottom, which isn't really helpful. Let me make my font a little bit smaller, very small, I guess. Um, and then do g diff again. Now it's side to side, and you can see what's. I deleted these lines right here. You can also um, you can also fix merges uh, merge conflicts and everything resolve conflicts. That's what I was trying to say. From there, makes it a lot easier. Um, and you can do things like I changed this file, so now I can do g write. I have these mapped to keys as well, but I'm just typing out what they they say. That did a git add essentially, and then I could do a g commit, and now it opens up vim uh, for editing the commit message. The nice thing about this having doing the commit messages in the same instance of Vim that I'm running is everything that you type in Vim or every file that you open in Vim goes into Vim's autocomplete so that you can use that to autocomplete your commit messages as you need. Uh, so I can say like uh, fixed, what file is this, declare, de, and I can just autocomplete it because it's all in the same one. And then I, uh, you know, wq, save it and it just closes that. I can also do like a git status, so it'll show me all the files that have changed. Nothing has changed, but let me go in and delete some more. And then this, now it shows me that uh, this is not staged for commit, but I have edited it. Now I can hit minus and that will stage it for commit. I can hit minus again to unstage that file. So I can work with this, I can work with this without ever having to leave Vim if I don't want to, which is pretty nice. <clears throat> Ooh. That's called fugitive. Get it the git in there. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, it's really awesome. <laughs> uh, and then the other one is syntastic, and we kind of showed that um, in here. I you do a lot of JavaScript development, but syntastic works for several languages. Um, if I save this file, actually, do I have it enabled? There we go. So now it's telling me. That's syntactic that popped up on the left there, and then when I mouse over that, it says a legal break statement in here. So it's uh, complaining about that, but this lets me kind of stay on top of all of my misspellings and typos as I'm editing. It just checks the file each time on save. So that's cool. 
Um, and it works with, out of the box, it works with several different things, but you can also configure it in your VimRC, telling it what you want it to actually run on each file save or not run. Uh, so it's very configurable. So those are the kind of the main plugins that I use. I have like 50 different plugins probably, um, but those are the main ones that I kind of boiled it down to. And yeah, IDEs still do a lot more, um, but we're Vimmers, we're a lot cooler anyway. <clears throat> so we can we can customize Vim to ta uh, and tailor it to the exact needs that we have. My needs aren't going to be the same as any of yours, probably. Um, I do a lot of JavaScript development, so I have a lot of JavaScript specific plugins in there. If you do a lot of um, you know Swift or Objective C development or Java or C plus plus whatever, you might have uh, several different plugins that look completely different to mine. So you can really configure it um, to the way that you need. Um, but we can still do more with Vim. So this is uh, how I typically run Vim with Tmux. Uh, does anyone use Tmux? Yeah? OK. Awesome. Yeah. T I love Tmux. Um, so you can get Tmux again from Homebrew if you're on a Mac. Uh, brew install Tmux or from whatever package manager that you may have. Uh, and all, what it is is it's a terminal multiplexer. You can view and control multiple consoles at once. Separate them out into windows. Each window can have multiple panes. You can have several different sessions, and you can pre-configure your environments. Excuse me, pre-configure your environments for whatever you need. Um, you can start a new session just by doing tmux new session s and whatever the session name is, um, and then work with it from there. So let me actually disconnect from this session. I actually have this mapped to a new command or to a command, a shell script that I wrote that will automatically. I hit tm, it lists out the command of the sessions that I currently have, or I can hit three to start a new session in this case. So I'll start a new session and I'll call this omg. And so now in the bottom left corner there, you can see it says OMG, that's the session name. Um, and then I have a window here that's called ZSH because that's the command that I ran. If I open Vim in here, it changes that to Vim. But I, that's not very helpful. So I typically, uh, if I list out the sessions that I have, I have my work session, I have this pasta session, which is just a random name I thought of uh, for the session name. If I go in there, you see I, down here I have dot .files and talk and dojo and automaton and vim and vim. The first four are ones that I custom named. So if I go to my dot .files, I can actually, I have it mapped, I'm not sure if it's a custom mapping or if it just works, I have it mapped to control A, comma, and I can change the name. So I can change it to, uh, Jay is asking a question. And now that, window is named Jay is asking a question. Jay, did you have a question? Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Are those local or remote Tmuxes? Can I mix and match remote Tmux sessions with local? Those are all local. Um, they're all local windows that's just, each one of those is running Z shell locally for that. I can SSH in from any of those and do whatever I need to from there. And then inside of that SSH, I could nest a Tmux session if I want, but you have to have... Yep. There, there is a way to connect to a remote session. Like directly, directly. without having to do SSH? You could, you could um, program these so that you have like a specific environment that comes up every time you run, and you could have the first command that it runs be an SSH into whatever box. And assuming you have your key set up, it could how, automatically... How would you program it to set up your environment when you first open? Yeah. Um, I have a... I don't always do it, but I do have a uh, file that I have. This is my dot .files, and inside of tmux, I have a dev.tmux.conf. And in here, this runs, it, it just will source the file. It'll source my original tmux.conf. So basically, when I connect to tmux, I have to pass it a command to tell it this is actually my configuration file to run. So then from this file, I source the original file so everything gets loaded as normal. Then I tell it I want to create a new session called dev um, with a window called IDE. And then I'm going to split that window vertically, uh, and it's going to have a, I think that's a height of 10, uh, inside of the dev <coughs> window. Percent. Huh? Percent. 10%, yeah. Um, and then I'm going to select that top pane, and inside of there, I'm going to split it. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to select the bottom pane, uh, and then I'm going to split it horizontally, uh, and then I'm going to create a new window that I'm going to call shell, and uh, select that window. And then I'm going to select 
the current pane, and that's where it's going to leave me. So when I run this, it's going to leave me in there. Can, can you run other commands outside of, or like outside oh, yeah. of Tmux commands? Yeah, you can just say uh, send keys, and uh, then it will just start typing. Like you can say send keys, SSH, whatever, and it will just type that in, CR for carriage return. That's very useful. Do you do yeah. That next? I don't know what that is. No, I think it's just blind sending. Yeah. So it's, not, it's not waiting for a response. Yeah, yeah, it's not waiting for a response. Sorry. So don't have a type your password for you. Another interesting thing that I do is if I'm if I'm managing like multiple servers, yep. I'll SSH into each server and then I'll synchronize all the panes so that everything I type into one gets sent. All yeah, I was going to talk about that. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I, I do that a lot. Um, yeah. The, there is also, so this is just running, this is basically running shell commands here. It's just changing my configuration file to this file and then running the original config and then running all of these commands. Um, there's actually a Ruby gem called tmuxinator that lets you configure your environments in YAML if you are into that sort of thing. Uh, and then you can manage it all through YAML files. Yeah, I was trying to use tmuxinator, but it didn't really let me do something this sophisticated. Yeah. So. Yeah, Th I think this is what I really want. To oh yeah, but essentially, um, I'm, I'm already in a team session, so I won't run it. But essentially, what that's doing is it's creating a new window. So I'll create a new window. Can you show us the result of that. Yeah, let me. Okay, let me disconnect here. Yeah, how do you how do you call that? So let me make sure that it's actually in here because it's in my. Um, this is my home directory. Yeah, dev.tmux.com. So I think it's tmux. Um, I forgot how to run it. It's been a while since I've run it. Is it dash C? Um, dot dev dot tmux. Okay, so you actually have to point it to the... You don't nope. have to. Oh, okay. Mine's set up so that it oh. automatically on our I accidentally just closed the shell, but that's okay because <laughs> I'm I'm running tmux, so... You can just reattach. Yeah, I just reattached, and I didn't lose anything. So going back into it... Uh, I can just hit TA to reattach to the last session I was in. Everything's back to where I was. No problem. Um, I totally forgot the command to run that, though. I should have remembered to look at that. Um, ugh. It's not dash C. It's, oh, tmux-f.dev.tmux.com. Totally didn't run it. I'll look at that at the end. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Do you know uh, if there's a way? So if you start a an empty tmux session, yeah, is there a way to record what you're doing with the command keys into those that commands? I because don't it would know be of way anything. Way easier just to set up the window you want. And Absolutely. Save it. <laughs> Absolutely. There is a way. Um, there. I haven't researched it enough yet. I haven't had enough time. But there's a whole plugin like. Similar to Vundle, there's a plugin system for Tmux, really? and there is one that will actually like, like you saw how I accidentally closed iTerm, and I just reattached to it. Well, if I shut down my system, uh, that session is gone. But there's actually a way to save that session uh, between restarts, and yeah. you can just bring it back up, so you can always have wow. that set up. Nice. Yeah, nice. Um, I haven't looked into it a whole lot, but I have seen that. I'm pretty sure. But anyway, what that was trying to do was it was trying to uh, create a, a a vertical split like that, and it was putting it at like 10%, so I can't get there with my commands, but essentially creating that and then horizontally splitting this, and so it had each of these different splits in there that we could use. So now I, I can see all of these, navigate. This is typically how I work, where I have Vim at the top, and then I'll have a, a terminal down here if I need to run a command or see the output of something right here. <clears throat> so can connect just like that. Um, the .tmux.conf in your home directory, that's your tmux configuration. Um, there's lots that you can do. If you look, my tmux looks very um, different from what it normally would look like. Um, mine doesn't have the, the ugly green bar. I wanted mine to look a little prettier than the default. So it, it lays everything out nice. I have a whole theme set up for it. I even have, um, I customize what's in my my uh, bar down here. So you can see I have the name of the session, all of the windows. I have Taylor Swift always. Um, and then I have the date and the name of the machine I'm on, which is Rugen. 
Um, How does it pull something like the music? The music, it is, I actually tell it, let me just open up the tmux config right here. Go down to the, actually it's in my theme file, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So in here, I just have, um, uh, you know, you just pass the, the uh, shells that out yeah, it shells that out and it will execute that. I think I have it executing every five seconds. It just executes the shell script and asks Spotify or iTunes. I have the audio one. I'm not using the audio one right now. Uh, yeah. But Spotify or iTunes, it asks them, hey, what music is playing right now? And one of them, or if they're both open, they'll both come back and I'll just have double in there, but I typically never have both open. So have you tried playing around with the new JavaScript support? Not yet. Yeah, yeah that's that's on my list to play around with, though. I thought you would have. Yeah. <laughs> Not yet. Uh, these scripts are really simple. They're you, um, can, you can pull content from pretty much anywhere. If they have the the built-in Apple script support, so this this one. If you have a command that spits out some output. It'll right. Yeah. And you could, you can get anything to it. Yeah. Okay. This is the Apple script. It just says if uh, application Spotify is running, then um, tell application Spotify to set the variables, so the name, the artist, the album, and then uh, return the little music icon with the name and the artist, dash the artist, and that's all it does. But you could, like, curl it sort oh, of yeah. somewhere. Yeah. Yep. And it doesn't have to be Apple Script. I'm just using that for, for this, but be way easier if you didn't have to write this. Well, yeah, because previously only Apple Scripts could really talk to the app applications. Yeah. This but it, in it. Yosemite, JavaScript can too, yeah. which is awesome. Yeah, I just could never bring myself to learn AppleScript. So. <laughs> so there's a lot you can do with um, Tmux, and that's all in your Tmux config. Um, the one that I think is the most important probably is this right here. Uh, whoops. Um, is by default, the prefix command for Tmux is Control B, which is kind of annoying because I'm lazy and Control B, like it's so far away and I have to like actually look at the keyboard to do that. I think that was compatibility with screen, right? Cause yeah, because, well, screen is control A. And it also, if you're using the default bindings for uh, uh, bash, then control A and control A or Emacs, they'll go to the beginning of that line. Yep, yep. So it gets that out of the way. Yep. Uh, but I, uh, I unbind that and I actually set it to control A. And then in my OS settings, I uh, go into the modifier keys settings and I change caps lock to control because I never want caps lock enabled oh. ever. Yeah. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. So now <laughs> if you look at your keyboard, caps lock is now control. So control A, it's just ba boom uh, right next to each other. That's where the control key is. Yeah, yeah exactly. And then control left bracket is escape. So you never have to move your hand to get the escape key. Yeah. You fill your pinkies and you're good. Yeah. There's actually a, pl a program called key remap for MacBook and, um, it will let you do more advanced uh, modifier key changes. So I can say con uh, caps lock is control when I press it with something else. Otherwise, if I press it by itself, it's escape. Hmm. Amazing. That's, that's, that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. If you look at the, the, the copy and paste for commands for tmux, they're left bracket, right bracket. So they kind of match the escape. And, so. Yep. <clears throat> so there's a lot that Tmux can do. Um, like like you were saying, we can synchronize panes, uh, which is really awesome. I've seen um, uh, I've seen people you know have a bunch of different terminal windows open and then they're trying to do things all at once. And there's a program that will do it for you. But you can also like if I create a bunch of different panes, and you know I can type in here echo hello, and it just runs in there. I have this mapped to prefix y, so I just say prefix y, and now everything is synced. So now I can say echo hello, and you can see it's typing into every one of them. And so I could be SSHing into several different boxes and running the same commands from one. If you're too lazy to have written a script to do it, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or if it's not worth writing a script to do it. Yeah. Oh yeah, if you can write a script to do it. Strive to be lazy. Is there a read-only like, attach port that you can give other people so they can watch you do stuff? Yeah, actually people use this for pair programming. You can yeah. You can connect to someone else's Tmux session and share it. Yep, this is great. Actually, I wasn't sure how this setup was going to be and whether or not I would just mirror my display or if I would actually have like my display down here and then another a second display, which is up there. What I've done for presentations before is um, if I you know, put this over here and then I open a new window, I would just have 
a terminal window on each one and I would connect, oops, connect to the same session. Oh, I connected to the wrong one. Uh, oops, which one is it? Uh, I'm currently connected to pasta, so two. Now I'm connected to the same one, and now I could, that way I could look down here, I didn't have to like try and look behind me and, and type commands, I could look at the screen, and it's just mimicking everything I do over here. Um, so you can use this, use this, you can definitely use it for pair programming. Um, I've seen tutorials that help you set up like a user, like a, a script that will generate a user that only has access to this file, or this system, and can only uh, attached to this session and then it deletes itself afterwards um, and it does that all through I think ngrok so that you have a you can expose yourself out remotely and stuff um, but there's also a fork of tmux called teammate which does all of that for you and lets you uh, remotely connect with someone else to do pair programming like this yeah yeah the, um, yeah, absolutely. And it's read yep. How do you make it read only for the attaching session? Wait, I don't know if you can re make it read only. I was just blindly you agreeing. Just use weird key mapping so they won't, be, no, they won't know what you're <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, that, that's yeah. actually true because yeah. Vim would be so specialized. Yeah. yeah. Or just change the key binding <laughs> so that it's like so yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you probably the number one key binding that I have, like do, colon wq is that's like three characters you have to type. Oh, four. You have to hold shift colon w. That, well, that's a lot, right? Yeah, doesn't do that by default. Teammate does. Teammate gives you a, a read only session. Yeah. On their server. I want to say you can do that with Tmux. I don't know how. I'm pretty sure I've read about that before. I think I have too. But I yeah, I don't know. Do it. it seems silly that Tmux yeah. would do it. Cause that yeah. seems like an obvious like feature. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, you can synchronize panes. You can create splits on the fly. I actually have um, Tmux set up so that I do control, uh, I do prefix, which is control A. So prefix H, J, K, or L. Um, I'm sorry, that's to move between them. So I do control, prefix H, I'm sorry, prefix J to move down, prefix H to move left, prefix K to move up. If I want to create a split, it's prefix pipe to create a vertical split, and uh, prefix minus to create a horizontal split. So it's just kind of logical. Did you remap same. Those? Yeah, I remapped all okay, of yeah. those. <laughs> it makes a lot more sense. To yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, what was the thing? Uh, but yeah, percent and quote. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's diagonal the... split? <laughs> yeah. I also have Vim set up to do that as well. Um, so I have Vim set up so that it's I can split Vim in a very sane way. I can just say control H, J, K, or L. So control L will create a right split. Control H will create a left or move to the left split, but if there's not another split to the left, it'll just create another one. And so I can just keep keep creating splits all over the place. So why do you use them sometimes sometimes for split? If I want to look at file like a lot of different files, I'll have I won't put them all into individual Vim sessions. I'll have them all in the same Vim. Also, that set, that Vim session will know about the same yep. buffers and everything. So typically when I'm working at home on my Thunderbolt monitor, I will have it split like this. And I will usually have six different files open that I'm looking at, which is totally not productive. Um, <laughs> but it, it actually, it's not too bad on a big monitor. Yeah. But that's typically how I'll have it. Also another great key, this is by default in Vim, or I'm sorry, in Tmux, control A, uh, or prefix Z. That will, whatever, whatever, um, split you're in, it will make it full screen, and then Z again to bring them back. So if I want to see everything, then I can see it, bring them back as I need them, and right. it keeps everything up. Can you take like a, a pane and uh, promote it to a full window? Uh, yes. yes. Want to tear off or something? I think so, yeah. Okay. Forget, forget how to do that. Yep. I've done that, before I knew about Control-Z, I had a whole script that I looked at from a tutorial that did that and 
then it tried to bring it back in because you can like take these panes, promote them to windows, and then move them back, and that's what it was trying to do. But and what's the default for uh, it? prefix Z? Is that not the default? Am I lying to you? Yeah. Um, it's not control Z, though. That doesn't do what I wanted at all. <laughs> well, like, is it control A Z or control, uh, yeah. control well, B? Z? Prefix Z works for me. Something must be eating white. Yeah. So, yeah, you can do that. So, Tmux and Vim are really awesome. Um, there's also a plugin called Vimux, which allows you to interact with Tmux from Vim. Um, and so you can do things like map, or you can call, you can say vimux run command from within vim, and execute a command in a vimux, or in a tmux split, and then um, oh. and then see the output immediately. So like, I have this repo here that I'll delete this split at the bottom, and um, I'll do, I'll just map it to a, a key. So I'll say n map, uh, I want to map leader z, to call vimix run command. Sorry if that's small. There we go. Vimix run command grunt test. So I want to run the tests for this. And then I have to hit enter. So I'll map that. Now all I have to do is hit leader Z. Leader is comma for me, so comma Z. And it automatically created the split for me and it ran grunt test down there. Which compiled all of my TypeScript and executed the tests. Um, now that that split is open, if I hit leader Z again, it will just use the same split. It's not going to create a new split each time. But now I can have that mapped to like do that every time I save the file and automatically see that. I never have to think about it. The, the files or the tests will just run below me. And um, if an error, you know, it'll turn red and I'll see it immediately. And then I can go investigate it. So it's a lot faster than, um, than having to manually because I'm lazy. I, I don't want to hit prefix A or H, uh, prefix J to go down and then grunt test and run that and then prefix K to go back up. That's so many keys and I'm so lazy. So I don't want to do that. I can just map it and you can do those maps on the fly or you can save those into your VimRC or a local VimRC. I have that set up so I can have VimRC.local in any, in any directory and it will source those all the way back up. Um, so there's a lot you can do. Um, I like Vim, and I think that you will too. Um, but if, even if you're not using Vim as your editor, um, learn whatever editor that you are using very well uh, so that you can be as productive, probably not as productive, and not as cool for sure. But um, you, know, you, can, you can be something, I guess. Um, the other thing I was going to talk about is, is your dot files, uh, or like your VimRC, your tmux config, all of that. Um, they're, they're really awesome. This is how you make Vim and Tmux, and you make your own environment that works well for you and the, and the software that you're writing. Um, and there's a lot of dot files out there on GitHub. Um, look at them, steal things from them, but don't just flat out copy them. Don't use things like Janus or other things that are, Janus is a, a default Vim configuration. That's default for, and it works well for somebody who created it, but does it work well for you? Is it gonna add a whole bunch of mappings that you're never gonna use? Is it just gonna clog everything up? Well, plus you can never possibly remember all of the exactly. shit that they contain. You exactly. Have, you have to put them in one piece at a time in order to learn them. Yeah, and every once in a while, I've done it once, I think since I started using Vim full time, I declared Vim bankruptcy, deleted my VimRC, <laughs> and then I just started adding things back in as I needed them. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that way, because like I go through, I'm like, I'm like, what the heck does leader A do? I never use that. Oh, it does that. Yeah. So never copy them directly. Steal things and get ideas, um, and then share them so that other people can see see them. Get it? Share. Um, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, share your, your dot files, uh, <laughs> steal ideas from others. There's mine, uh, Nick Nisi slash dot files. All of my Vim, Tmux, and ZSH uh, configs are on there along with other things. Uh, GitHub, yeah, sorry. Uh, also my Git configuration, all of that, because I have a lot of nifty Git tricks in there. How do you manage keeping um, 
like API credentials and stuff like that out of, out of your dot files? Yes, uh, that's a good question. Um, I won't bring it up because I'm recording this, but I actually have. Um, so I, I was. Let me just finish this real quick. Yeah. Keep practicing. Um, I added. I put all these slides and everything up here um, at Vim Workshop. So check it out. Um, and then, like, I wasn't going to end here. I was going to actually go through a little bit of my dot files to kind of give examples. So I'm going to, whoops. Oh my gosh. I'm going to rename this from Jay's asking a question back to dot files. And um, so th these are my dot files. What I actually do is I use Z shell. And in my ZSHRC, um, I actually have set up a, where is it? Oh, if a bin directory exists in my, oh no, wait. Yeah, if a local RC exists, source it. So I can put everything in local RC and that's, I'm not actually saving it to my dot files, it's just on that machine. And then if I move it, I have to remember to. Yeah, so you just set up like uh, variables and stuff with yeah. the, the private stuff in there. Yeah, like I have all of my, my keys and everything in that file. And then it just gets sourced, and it's not. Did you try, did you try uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I have that set up in here. Um, the other thing is, like, I have my dot file set up all weird. I have actually an install script that goes through and everything with a dot sim link. It creates a sim link in the home directory and puts a dot in front of it. Yeah, nice. um, That's yeah, yeah, it makes it really nice for for keeping cool. everything. Is set that a up. script you wrote? Uh, I copied it from somebody, okay. Zach Coleman, I think. Anyway, that's, that's that's not a bad approach. Yeah, yeah, it works really well. So that's my uh, Z shell. Uh, I was going to bring up my VimRC a little bit. Where's Vim? Oh. Um, so here's my VimRC, and as you can see, it's 444 lines. So I've got quite a bit in there, um, but I've got it kind of set up, um, split off pretty well. So I've got all of my general configs. I've actually got my whole list of plugins in another file just to manage it. <laughs> so let me open that. I see. I see. So you've, uh, oh. you've aliased common... Uh, Misspellings. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> so plugins.vim. Here's all of my plugins. This line, this file is 77 lines long. I turn plugins on and off as I need them. If they're commented out in here, the plugins aren't loaded at all. Um, and then I can just experiment. That's why Vim uh, Vundle is really great because you can experiment, and uh, I can tell it to install just by doing colon plugin. Oops. I'm not going to run it because it'll take forever. But I could do plugin. I'll run plugin install. It will just go through and look for anything that I don't have installed and install it and done. Uh, if I do plugin update, it'll go and update to the latest of each of those. Um, but the main plugins that I have, I have them kind of split off. It's kind of messy in here, but um, so instead of like <coughs> get cloning all of these things into your your Vim directory, you just, yeah, you just do that. Okay. Yep, and so they're inside nice. of this bundle directory, and they're all cloned right within there. And then Vundle just manages it. These are all get ignored in my um, dot files, okay. so they're so not. You just uh, get clone your dot files and then run your script and then do your plugin install. Yeah, I actually have Vundle installed as a submodule and another submodule in there, so you. Update, add the submodule, or um, you know, update the submodules. Sub then you just do open vim, colon plugin install, and or you can do vim space plus plugin install, and it'll execute plugin install immediately when it opens, uh, and install all of those. I didn't think of doing it as a submodule. I like that. I experimented a lot, and I don't know if I like submodules all that much. Yeah, there's two ways of doing it: submodules and subtrees. So I'm yeah, I need to look into subtrees more. Yeah, they're both. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I have all of that set up, and my install script does a whole bunch of things. If I actually look at that, it does. Uh, it updates the submodules, then it um, sources link, which I don't remember what that. Is. Oh, that does the sim linking. Then, if I'm running OS X, then it's going to install Homebrew automatically, brew everything that I want in here. So I'm going to get uh, run the brew.sh script, which installs ACK and Git and MacVim and um, all of those. Oh, so you could pretty much just stand up your whole dev environment. Yeah, I I just got this machine, and well I on I had a MacBook Air 
And over the holidays, I reinstall, I, I did a clean install of Yosemite, and then two weeks later, I got this MacBook Pro, and it took me 20 minutes to get everything set That's back up on both of them. Nice. Like, really simple. I've got mine set up so that I have a puppet vagrant script. Oh, nice. Um, so I just yeah. That's do really one nice. thing, and it sets up the entire machine. Yeah. However you do it, it's worth it to get this set up. Because if this machine fails, I can go to another machine. Yeah, I know people have been using like Puppet or Boxner or something to do that sort of thing, but I've never seen Vim used to, s to set all that stuff up before. Yeah. So it sets all of that up, and then, um, anyway, going back, the, the main things that I wanted to show in here were, um, just not to keep this going because I could talk for hours on this file alone. Um, I have this set up so that my backup directory, like it doesn't create the swap files in line with all the other nice. files. Oh. It puts it into a Vim temp directory in my home directory oh. and they're there if I need it. Uh, usually I don't ever need them and I just go in and delete them whenever they're there. <laughs> but uh, That's a good idea. yeah, there's that. Um, the other thing is I set clipboard to the unnamed clipboard so that Whenever I yank something, it puts it onto the OS X clipboard, and then I can just control V into another app. So I can oh, I can go here oh. and Y Y, and then I can go over and open up Atom or something. And someday, Boy, yeah, oh, arrow keys, control V, and I can paste whatever is right into there. So, so unnamed is the system clipboard. Yeah. Okay. There's there's also um, if you're running stuff from the command line, there's a command called pb copy that will yeah. take whatever the output and throw it into the board. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I think that's probably what that uses under the. Probably and actually to run it in Tmux, there is actually more things that oh, you okay. have to do uh, because Tmux totally devours all of that. Yeah. But there is actually if I go to my Tmux config. Uh, the first thing that I do is I execute a default command, which is this reattach to user namespace command, mm -hmm. which is something that I installed from Homebrew. You install that, and then it brings the clipboard sanity back to okay. Tmux. Uh, this is something that you need only if you're on um, OS X. Uh, so I actually have to update this script, because I, I have a Linux box too, and this just fails every time I try and connect because I, I hardly ever use it but if I need to I, ju I should actually have it execute a different script that checks to see if I'm on OS X and if I am or check to see if reattached to user namespace exists and then run it otherwise just uh, open up a new Z shell session um, so I have that set up that makes it really nice now I can do things like I can copy things out of here and I can go in and you know paste everything Ugh, I don't know what I did and I can't I can paste everything into any application. Um, and same thing from from within from within uh, Tmux itself. I can do control A escape and now I can navigate this with H J K N L and I can shift V or V to Tmux highlight. So the orange is the Tmux highlighting, and then I can Y to yank that and I can go over into whatever file I'm in. This is actually my slide deck, so hopefully. And I pasted all of that in there. Oh, wait, did I? No, I didn't. I may have. I may have screwed that up. <clears throat> what I typically do is I hold Alt, and then I highlight with the mouse. I know, I use the mouse and the worst, uh, and then paste it in there. I also have mouse. Do I do have the mouse... Um, set up so in in my tmux.com and in my vimrc i have mouse turned on and that's just so when i'm moving from one screen like from one application over to here i can just click into the window that i want to be in and if i'm in if i have multiple vim splits i can click into the split that i want to be in so yeah that's that uh, otherwise i i never use it when i'm actually working in it it's just when i initially switch into it um Trying to think if there was anything else. The other thing is the uh, MRC. So I kind of have everything set off. Oh, um, I have this set up so that I can 
I have my background and my color scheme actually controlled through my Z shell, so it just looks for exported globals in there. And I have all of that set up through, uh, I'm currently using this base 16, which has a ton of different themes, and a dark and light for every one of them. Yeah, it's it's great, and so I can I actually have um, aliased, uh, you know I have dark and light, so I can just say uh, if I could spell light, and it will just immediately change everything. And if I go back into Vim, oh, almost. If I go into a new Vim session, then it's light, um, and then I can switch it back to dark quickly too. So that, that's great if I'm giving presentations and it, I don't have a nice projector like this and I have to switch to light, then it works uh, really well for that. Um, and then I can change the the theme as well. And so I handle all of, all of that. The themes are synced, so there is a iTerm theme, or actually a, a shell theme, which is all of these files for like Brewer Dark is this file. This is the shell theme. And then there is a corresponding uh, Vim color scheme that matches this so that the shell and Vim always have the same theme. I configure it in one place and it works really well. And I think that's it, unless anyone has any questions or anything. So one thing with T-Box, and I, this is really buggy live, this was really buggy last time I used it. Uh, if you're using iTerm2 in OS X and T-Box, you can actually have iTerm2 connect to a Tmux session and all the tabs in Tmux will turn into tabs in iTerm2. And it was, and you can do that over SSH, except the last time I used it was really buggy and it crashed. Yeah. So you might as well just use Tmux directly. But it, it was just kind of one of those things that was fun to fiddle around with for a day and try. Yeah. Last time I looked at that, you actually had to have a different version of Tmux, like a, oh, really? a alpha version or something. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't, know I don't want the window crow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want my nice, pretty pink split borders in there. And that's all, all configured. There's actually, like I said, there's a plugin system um, for Tmux, and there's themes for Tmux and everything. So you can get, uh, you can see I have the um, the power line theme for Vim here. This is actually airline, but it's, you know, it's got these weird characters and everything. You can get the same thing for your your um, Tmux bar down here. But yeah. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you.